time of ice. Trilobites are an ancient group of arthropods, one of the first true arthropods, so um, creatures with usually many legs um, that are jointed and have a hard exoskeleton, so you think of an insect or a crustacean or an arachnid. Um, trilobites don't have any living direct descendants. Um, their closest relatives are the arachnids, that would include spiders, ticks, scorpions, and now horseshoe crabs are classified within arachnida. The calamine, diacalamine. This is a sororid trilobite. It's been very damaged. It hasn't preserved super well. This is a much better preserved sororus. This is an extremely well-preserved sororus. They have these granulations around the very small crescent-shaped eye structure, and they have these cheek spines and these two pagidial spines. So the reason that a trilobite like sororus or like dicranurus would develop these long protrusions and also have these teeny tiny little eyes probably have to do with the same reason. Um, so small eyes are associated with darker habitats, so further off the continental shelf than something like a fake hopid like this, which probably relied on eyesight quite heavily, therefore lived in a better lit environment. Um, and if you look around this fake hopid, the rock is really rough, which means it was a closer to the shore environment. Um, trilobites, or sorry, sand grains that are really close to the shore preserve in these rough looking rocks. Meanwhile, we have this dark, dark, dark material, and it's very fine and smooth compared to the other. So that's a muddier substrate that this creature is living in. So these long spines would have actually prevented Sororus or Dicranius or Gabrius Sororus that we're looking at here from sinking into the mud. It's very common in Paleozoic fossils. Um, it's called the snowshoe effect. So we have small eyes and we have the snowshoe adaptation and that would have prevented a trilobite from sinking into the mud if it were resting. Um, so going from front to back, they're divided into three lobes. So you have the median lobe and then you have the two lateral lobes. Um, they can have any number of adaptations in terms of ornamentation, um, eye size or shape. Um, all of these spiky bits that come out, they're called genal spines, and they can evolve in different ways for all sorts of different evolutionary advantages. Um, this structure here was originally believed to contain the glabella, uh, sorry, it's called the glabella. It was originally believed to contain the brain of the animal, it actually houses the digestive organs. So, and then going this way, you have the cephalon, or the head. In the middle, we have the thorax, just like with any other arthropod, and then at the very end, we have the pygidium. In this particular trilobite, the thorax and the pygidium seem to be one thing but in other trilobites it's a little bit more obvious such as this is some type of looks like an eldregiops very simple looking phacopid where the pygidium is fused so phacopids have really big eyes with really big lenses and they're often found in limestones and sandy limestones um, places where you'd find a lot of near-shore type creatures. Um, but the trilobite we're here to talk about today is an odontoplurid. 
So odontoplerid trilobites have a complex lens, but their eye is very, 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 very small. And not only that, but kind of similar to the sororans, which this is, they have some pretty long spines, although they tend to have more of them in the genal spines. So this is a phacopid with some pretty good genal spine ornamentation. These are odontopleurids. At least this one is, I don't remember what group Catneraspis belongs to. This is Dipranurus. Um, it's a very rare trilobite because it doesn't preserve very well. When you have these enormous, delicate structures, such as the genal spines on Dipranurus and some other odontopleurids, it becomes very difficult to preserve them for hundreds of millions of years. The reason that this trilobite is called dicranurus is actually from this structure here. It starts as one horn-type structure in the glabella, and it bifurcates or it forks into two things that curl back on themselves. And it's really amazing um, if you're lucky enough to ever see one where it's been carved out. The amount of skill and training that goes into being able to do that is extraordinary. Um, I just want to show the trilobite next to it because it's an interesting preservation. Um, this is Catneraspis. Let me just move the camera. This is Catneraspis. It looks like some type of Eurypterid or sea scorpion's head is right here. Um, Catneraspis has some tubercles, which are um, cone-like ornamentations as well as some granulation. This is the eye. Um, it's a little bit bigger than the eye of Dicranurus but it is nonetheless very small for a trilobite, especially a trilobite in New York. So please excuse the tripod from being in the shot. Um, for some reason today my tripod is giving me a little bit of agita. Um, so I have my watercolors and I have all sorts of pencils and paint brushes here. Um, this is another really cool tool that I swear by. It's um, the Mono Zero eraser pen. It really took me to the next level in terms of what I'm able to do with negative space and highlight. So today the trilobite that we're going to be reconstructing is Dipranurus monstrosus. We looked at a relative of it in the book um, Dicranurus monstrosus is known primarily from Morocco, but you can find Dicranurus fossils very rarely in New York State and in Ohio. Um, there has never been a full Dicranurus fossil found in New York State. There's been one, I believe, or one nearly complete fossil out of Ohio, but the rest of the Dicranurus specimens we know of, whether they're monstrosus or another species, have come from Morocco. So trilobites, like most animals that we think of when we think of animals, are part of bilateria, so they have bilateral symmetry. Just like us, we have a left side and a right side that are more or less the same. And Dicranurus also has 13 segments. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's ten. Eleven, twelve, and thirteen. So you don't have to have the exact angles yet, just mark off where those thoracic and pygidial segments are going to be. So Dipranurus has a very small eye, and it has a complex lens, but we're not getting into that yet. Its eye is here. Um, it has a kind of strange looking glabella with like a divot here, kind of like a scorpion. I 
I look at scorpions pretty closely. Um, it has this sort of lip on the front of the cephalon, which I can't remember what it's called because I am not a trilobite specialist. So we're going to start marking in where some of the shading is going to be. We're, we're not going to be super heavy with the with the pencil because we might add some color in. Haven't decided yet. This kind of form, it's like a very squat little cone almost, but it's kind of bean shaped. Um, I don't really know how to describe it. I'm not really up on the, the lingo of trilobites. Maybe some of you can sound off in the comments. So we're just roughing out where these forms are. We're not getting into too much detail at this point. The other eye is somewhere over here. Up here, actually, but we're not going to spend too much time on it at this exact moment. So the thing that sets dicranurus and other odontofluorids apart are going to be those genal spines, but we're not going to get into them until we get the basics down. The thing about dicranurus in particular is its actual body, its actual thorax and pygidium are pretty small. If you compare it to other trilobites, We're going to connect, make sure all of our genal spines are connected to the thoracic segment that they're coming out of and that they're completely connected. We're going to treat these areas as negative, but I'm going to get into that in a minute. And that's connected here. We're going to erase this area so that we can see that the genal spine is coming out of that thoracic segment. We can put a little dimple there and we're going to focus on the cephalic horns now. So they kind of end abruptly. They're usually flat on the end. We're close to it. And they have a lot of like little curves in them. Part of why it's believed that these long genome spines came about in addition to the snowshoe adaptation that I described was um, either to scare predators into thinking that they would get hurt if they tried to mess with the dicranurus. Um, there's also a belief that that these spines, if, if instead of darting away from a predator, that the trilobite could just kind of sink to the bottom like a piece of organic matter and just go completely undetected. Okay, I found my my pencil. Um, pale blue fell under the desk. Um, we are going to go in and treat that eye now. 
Um, so dipre we are going to be using a sharpie. Um, so dipreneurus has a little bit of a round thing, but it's ultimately it's a funny shaped eye. And we're just going to do little teeny tiny cross hatches. And then we're going to go over this with the white. We're going to make sure on our hand the white is still working. It is. We're probably going to come in and do a little bit of pencil on that because I'm not super thrilled with it so far, but we need to let all of that ink dry. Um, so let's just circle back to that. We're going to do the horn. Again, we have that outline, thin outline if you want to call it that, and then we have a, an outer highlight. Outer highlights are the unsung heroes of the art world. I don't want to hear it from anyone. the ink builds up on the pen and you just have to get it clean. So we are going to try to bring out this area here, this area in here, and we're going to do it using stippling. And then once we get up here, and if you have anything on the outside here, just clean it up with your white pen. They're very helpful. Um, We're going to bring in a little goldenrod and a little burnt umber for these areas in here. It may look like I just completely covered this up. We are building it out.
sorry, I'm using a Bunsen burner as a tripod now. Um, and it's an old one and it's getting rust all over the drawing, so I keep blowing it off. So these entire areas are going to be stippled over, so it's not the end of the world, but I didn't bring all of the supplies I needed to do this drawing, but it's close. Mwahaha. Okay, and then we're cleaning off our pen again. Okay. So I recommend that you, if you draw a trilobite using stippling, you stipple over the relief of its back and a few different places. So most of the dots that are going to be in this are going to be in these areas up here, which are going to be highlight, but they're also going to be the areas that would have been most visible, so that's where you're going to put the most of your white ink. Oops. And we clean off the pen again. We blow off the rest. Put a few stipples in the darker, but mostly you want them in the light. So we're gonna go up this entire genal spine, make sure you're curving the stipple lines to reflect the roundness of your form. If you're not doing that, you're going to make your trilobite look a lot flatter.
and then sometimes you take the entire paint out of the container and you didn't need to. That's what I mean when I say that I am a messy painter. I really am. Just get any water droplets off the page that aren't supposed to be there. Thing. Oops, we're gonna we're gonna try to be more careful of that water. We're gonna grab some white without taking the entire tub of white onto the page. We're gonna put it down the middle of this genal spine. here even though it's one that we washed um, for aerial perspective or hydro perspective as it were because it's underwater. So for the rest of them, we are going to make it a little bit less blue. This is a graphite pencil that we're going over the color with. Um, at this phase, so I'm doing this primarily because I did forget my colorless blender, otherwise I would be using a brown pencil and blending it. Um, but at this phase, if you do decide to go over your finished drawing in graphite, um, you should definitely not use a number two pencil um, for the reason that if you do, your drawing will appear shiny. Um, I also don't recommend using a 10B like I just used, it's way too dark. Um, we are going to use a 5B, so it's going to be a little bit lighter and we're going to apply it a little bit more conservatively. See, we're, we're taking the structure into account. And we're going to blend that. So for these areas back here, um, because contrast is going to be much lower, we're going to do the same thing. And it's going to be much, much more. We're going to keep those weddings in mind like I mentioned before. And then that's probably going to be the barrier, sort of, not that there's going to be a super hard and fast barrier, but between the stuff that we generalize a little bit more and the stuff that we don't, that's going to be about the threshold. We can actually go all the way over this because the areas we shaded in are going to be darker anyway. And again, we have this wonderful tool. Just get any little crap off of it that's not supposed to be there.
actually should be using a much lighter shade for what I just did. So for the lighter areas, we're going to be using, let me think about it for a minute, we're going to use a 2H for the, on top, in here, and then a darker pencil for the other areas we're going to take care of that eye. It's okay for your cross hatches to curve. It's actually something I recommend you learning to do if you don't do it. Um, Not everyone does it. For paleoart, it's really useful because we're talking about structures that, for the most part, don't really exist in a way that we perceive in the normal world anymore. It's a 5D, I need my 2H. It's the same thing. Creating structure, and then my 5B we can go in the shaded because otherwise it's very dark. And we just keep going. A lot of rust on the paper because I haven't been paying attention. each and you can use your blender on this if you want to um, I just don't want to be using my paperless blender until I need it um, you should be communicating that each one of these it's like a series of beads almost. That's what you want it to feel like that that can move. Um, so I will say that for this area here, the contrast of the really dark pencil might actually be a good thing. Especially if you are super smart and you highlight appropriately.
then we're just picking up any excess graphite that we don't need. You don't want to overdo it. And then we're going to blend. So it's always smart to have two gel pens, um, so you can alternate between them. I find that they tend to need breaks. <laughs> That's the one thing I did bring, and I brought two, thankfully. Back to the original. So you just clean up if you want to with the white pen. Anything that you forgot to erase and then drew over in another medium. Okay, and then we're going to focus on the pedidial end. Actually, before we do that, let's just make sure our genal spines are all stippled. And our thoracic segments. So how you treat the distance in this, generally what you'll want to do, um, you'll want to space the stipples out a little bit more. You can't really make them smaller, um, but you can 
space them out a little bit more. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to come up and we're going to, we're still curving, but we're making it slightly farther away. So as you can see in the beginning, and we could actually even go in if we want to, we can add some more detail with this pen. Like that. Um, okay. So, thank you so much for watching. This has been Dicranurus Monstrosus. Have a wonderful day. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.